This government wants to tell all those Queenslanders that they're idiots. All those poor mum and dad investors, when this government went way beyond, way beyond what the National Cabinet were proposing for mum and dad investors in their tenancy. We believe there should be a balanced approach. It is about compassion and practicality with tenants and landlords. But this government, who the minister opposite is, uh, is saying, they're, they're, listen to us, we're, we've got your right interests, but don't ask us any questions, is really abusing those thousands of mum and dad investors who were the ones who were writing letters to the government. We didn't write them. We were getting the letters from them too, because, because they, understood, they understood that the balance wasn't there, and that was the concern. The National Cabinet process has moved quickly, but not this government, and we have been waiting for the detail. So finally we are here before the House in this rushed sitting where we got the legislation mid-afternoon yesterday, mid-afternoon yesterday, and now we're before the House and debating it. But not all the legislation is here because we still haven't seen the provision with respect to commercial leases. The retail shop leases are covered as already prescribed and regulated uh, contracts, but there's a whole raft of other contracts that were uh, part of the mandatory code that the National Cabinet uh, brought down that haven't come before this parliament yet in legislation or regulation. And I want to just go through a few of those because uh, members have been covering some of the issues with the distress that both tenants and also landlords, which might be a surprise to the minister and are ranting before, because most of the people who are actually the landlords of the houses are actually small mum and dad investors. And guess what? The same is actually true with a lot of commercial property as well. It certainly is on the Sunshine Coast. So I'm not talking about the Westfields, I'm not talking about the land leases and the stock Stocklands and the really big guys. I'm talking about all those mum and dad investors who are actually the majority of people who worked hard, they might have been doctors and nurses or teachers, whatever their background, who had an aspiration. And so that's why it's important that government doesn't lecture to those people and say they're idiots and rant like we've just heard the minister do because they will get it wrong. And it's vitally important that for everyone's sake we get it right. Because not only is it about lessening the impact on people today, it's about ensuring that there is going to be rental accommodation and commercial accommodation into the future and that people have the confidence to invest in that sector. If we're to rebuild Queensland, you've got to be able to listen to those voices and not abuse them, not abuse them. In regard to the uh, uh, Small Business Commissioner, I do want to address this because I think that actually it is a positive move to have mediation available to those many, many uh, situations that would be just bogged down in QCAT. QCAT is a train smash. There's so many delays of QCAT. And so to have an alternative mechanism for mediation, if it's done right, I think is actually a positive. And currently in Queensland, that role had been provided by the, uh, the National Small Business Ombudsman, the Australian Small Business and Family Enterprise Ombudsman. But in respect to the history that the uh, Minister uh, for Small Business was uh, putting into the House here before, I think I need to correct the record. The previous Small Business Commissioner that briefly existed in 2011, introduced by a Labor government and abolished by the Newman government, it, it's true, it was abolished by the Newman government, but let's get the facts right, had absolutely no statutory power. And I will table the uh, library briefing because I thought, I want to find out what, what did they actually do. Nothing in the statute. Library couldn't find out where it was in any statute. No power. It was powder puff. So it was a title not a role with substance. I, I do believe that uh, what's being proposed in principle to have a small business commissioner with a role, that will provide opportunity for a panel of uh, adjudicators to help, a panel of mediators rather to help, is a positive step because it is important that people not only negotiate in good faith uh, and avoid a dispute, but have access to good information early and hopefully are able to work as much out as possible. Because when we say we're all in it together, 
well, not everyone has, a, has an even uh, power balance in that process. And I do acknowledge that uh, with some of the small business tenants who have approached me, a uh, concern they had that they couldn't get some of their landlords to talk. And uh, that was certainly the case of one hairdresser who contacted me who was quite distressed losing, in her case, 50 per cent of her business. It's probably more by now. Uh, and I said, look, you still need to make the offer, have a, a conversation, start putting it in writing. But I'm sorry, we still haven't seen the legislation. Well, finally, we saw the legislation that partly addresses their situation. But there are all these other tenancies and landlords where we still haven't seen that because it hasn't come before the House. I want to refer to the briefing that I had uh, from the, uh, the Minister for Small Business, and thank you for the briefing yesterday afternoon. And as I understand from that briefing, that there will be a panel of mediators to provide a non-binding mediation. So that's not where they've got the ability to compel evidence or a mediation. And I'm not sure if I heard the Minister in the House saying before that the Small Business Commissioner would have uh, the power to compel mediation. That's not my... Okay. Com thank you. Because uh, I, I can't see it in the legislation and whether that's... I've missed it in the legislation. I can't actually see that in the legislation. I'd like to have a, a, an explanation where is it in the legislation. Uh, if it's coming forward in regulation, I think that's a bit of a mistake. It should be in the legislation. But I will table also a brief in respect to the relative powers of all the small business commissioners who exist in Australia. They have different powers, but the New South Wales one, quite clearly in the legislation, uh, makes it clear about their powers to uh, require people to participate in, um, in mediation. And that role has evolved to have stronger powers and, uh, over the years, but it's got a much clearer set of powers in, in regard to the legislation. So what we're looking at here uh, today doesn't really outline those powers as such, but I acknowledge that the government's saying it's a trial. They'll have this in place till the end of the year uh, and uh, then look at it again and potentially may legislate uh, more fully. But I don't see those powers that have been alluded to before, but I'm happy to be corrected if, if they can be identified in legislation. If they're to come forward in regulation, I think that's a mistake and uh, it should have been in this legislation. But with respect to the commercial leases that aren't yet covered, as I understand for the briefing, briefing that uh, they will, when they're legislated, uh, have the mediation be able to be done by the uh, Small Business Commissioner, but those changes in legislation are to be brought down by uh, Justice and Attorney General, so I was told, and that the current emergency response bill allows regulations for both retail shop leases, uh, but it will also cover those who are under the mandatory code of conduct when those changes are made. We must see them soon. When's Parliament sitting again? Oh, Lord knows. That's one of those mysteries these days. It hasn't got much to do with health. It's more to do with the convenience and the ability of the government to move. But we do need to see that sooner rather than later. Um, I want to also mention, as I did before, about uh, some of the mum and dad landlords, because uh, this is one I received uh, where this couple wrote to me the rent from our commercial property is our monthly income. They're not wealthy. This is our monthly income. Even so, our mortgage payments are suspended until November, but interest will accumulate. We have bills to pay. And they're quite desperate. And still we don't know how they will be in regard to being able to, well, live, uh, because they're not entitled to other handouts and grants and stuff because they actually rely on income from their investment property. I want to, uh, oh, I, I also do declare that uh, as per my register of interest, I also have investment properties. Uh, I'm fortunate though, I'm not like so many others who've lost tenants and that's why it is important that people are able to work these matters through. But that's on the register of interest as is the fact that I'm a director of my mother's company and she also has uh, tenancies and rentals as well. I want to go to the issue of the retrospectivity of some of the provisions. And I know it's been talked about, it's necessary and all this, but there are pretty big penalties for retrospective provisions in the Act when we hadn't seen the Act. We only saw the bill come 
uh, out for a consultancy. I think it was already really drafted. We got first glance of it yesterday afternoon. But it does concern me, anything that's retrospective, with quite substantial penalties. Was it about $60,000? Yeah, so that is a concern. I am concerned by the Henry VIII clauses in, in this bill, and I understand that we're told it's for emergency reasons, but they have the ability to alter substantive acts. And uh, given that we don't know what the government may seek to bring forward by regulation that impacts upon acts, uh, legislation that comes before the full parliament, that's also a concern. I was interested to see some comments that the now Treasurer uh, made in regard to Henry VIII uh, clauses, as well as the now Leader of uh, Government Business. And they certainly weren't chatting. They were talking about the issues around executive government and doing things without Parliament. And I think that it's interesting they had those views then, but uh, today we see quite strong powers coming forward and not clearly what they intend to amend in acts via regulation. That's not something we should be championing. We need to know more clearly what is it that they envisage? What is it that they envisage? The other issue I want to raise is that there is to be rental relief. The government announced a rental package. It sounded good, but people still haven't seen it. And that's really causing a lot of distress too. And I want to quote from one person who was after that rental relief package who said, um, I know this was asked last week, but has any, anyone actually been contacted by the RTA in regard to rental grant or receive funds yet? I have a tenant that applied on the day it started, on the 2nd of the 4th, still nothing finalised, have not been contacted. A second tenant provided the information uh, one and a half weeks ago, still no reply. Third tenant got a reply that they'll get a reply within four days, and that was several weeks ago. So when's it actually going to come through? How hard can it be? Why is it taking so long? I want to also address the control issue well, the Parliament of Queensland bill and some of the provisions that are mooted for remote sittings and the ability to use electronic measures. And it's once again supposed to be to do with extraordinary events of COVID. Now, not all the legislation, though, is extraordinary. So I am very uncomfortable with a provision that's giving the power for executive government, potentially, to shut down the voices, except you've, when you've got your finger on the switch and that voice can speak. And whether you like it or not, the beauty of a chamber where you can see people and you can know that they're going to speak and they'll agree and disagree. It's a very organic, granular process. It's pretty robust, but it's the best one that we've got. And while there is a place for electronic measures uh, where there's an extraordinary circumstance, boy, you've got to have some checks and balances around it. I don't see that here. I am concerned by it because whoever's got their finger on the switch to turn it off You'll never know who's had their voice shut down. And that, I think, is something that you have no public gallery that can witness it. You have no witnesses who can see that happen. That is something that can be done in secret, and that really doesn't yet have the checks and balance that I think uh, are appropriate if we're going to have technology that can facilitate, but can also eliminate the voices that must always be heard, whether the government likes it or not, it is important that the one can be heard and not just the majority, because we all come in here and represent our constituents who have voted for us to come down and speak on their behalf and to know that we're doing everything we can to make sure that we represent their voices. So we do want to see fair and balanced uh, uh, laws and regulations. Don't know if that's going to happen yet with the commercial stuff. Uh, I do hope that the uh, level of detail that's required to make sure that's fair is done soon. So all these people who are still in distress, who don't know what the, the, the sphere is, that, what the regulations they're dealing with, both landlords and tenants, tenants, it's got to be resolved. We've got to see that soon. We certainly want to see that. And so that for those who really are fighting to get on with their lives, they know what the rules are, and they can do that and work in good faith to achieve that.